this afternoon, I wanted uh, to touch a, a very, I, I think, important uh, topic because uh, Christians often love to take portions from the Bible and mix them together and put their own seasoning so it will be to their own taste. And oftentimes, they fail to divide the word rightly. So I thought when it comes to the judgments of God, I thought there's so much confusion in this world that it's probably best if we gave a whole teaching on it. So before we do, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we ask to be sanctified by your truth this afternoon. In Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all, for all of you who speak Afrikaan, you've already laughed at me. <laughs> but I discovered upon landing that Amir is an ant. <laughs> it's not funny. And when, when I was told that, a lady approached me at the end of the service with some loving and compassionate eyes. And she said, but the ant is a biblical animal. And it has good qualities. And, and I'm like, I'm not an ant. Amir Ki. And little ant. So I heard today. Yes. No. My name comes from Isaiah chapter 17. And my name is not Damascus. <laughs> my, <laughs> further on, one of the words there is that um, the uppermost bow or branch of the tree in Hebrew is Amir. Okay? So, so for your information, I'm a Jew from the tribe of Judah, born in Jerusalem with a Hebrew name, not Afrikaan. <laughs> okay. And then a couple other people said, yeah, you know, but you can actually... Uh, translated to a, a war, Amir. And I'm like, do I look like a wall? So another one came, you can also translate it to a lake. We will stop right here. No more African translations to my name. Isaiah 17. So, let's begin with the very, very simple truths that God made the earth to be the place for mankind to dwell. Am I right? Yes. Yes, the animals are here and yes, the sea and there's sun and the moon and the stars. But the crown jewel of his creation was mankind. And we all know that. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, then God said, let us make man in our image. The only thing that was made in his image. And then the Bible says, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish and over the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female only. Um, <clears throat> he created them. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. That's why, <laughs> man and woman. And the Bible says, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Obviously, earth was created for mankind. And obviously, it is for him to take dominion. And he is in the image of God. And of course, he is in fellowship with God. God descended to fellowship with man. When you, in Genesis 3.8, we see that in, when, after they ate from that fruit... They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Which means 
that the presence of God, and by the way, it's interesting, because for many years, you know, the Hebrew language was not a spoken language. It was a language where you read scriptures, but it wasn't spoken. And a lot of Jewish people throughout history started speaking Aramaic and started speaking Greek, and they needed translation of the Old Testament into Aramaic and into Greek. And one of the translation was the Onkelos translation into Aramaic, which by the way says, and they heard the sound of the word of God. Memra, word in Aramaic, walking in the, who is the word of God? Who is the one who is the word and the word became flesh? You understand that there was fellowship. By the way, this is the same way when Moses entered in Exodus 33 into the tabernacle. The Bible says that he talked to God face to face as one speaks to his friend. Who is he? Who is the one he spoke to face to face? Hmm. John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwell among us, and he, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But we all know in Genesis 3 that man preferred not to fellowship with God because man believed that man can be God. Who told man that by eating certain fruit, he can be like God? Exactly. And when man realized, after he was banished from the Garden of Eden, that he did not become God, then man wanted to reach God. And in Genesis 11, and they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose stop is where? In the heavens. I remember it was so creepy. I woke up in the morning, the first day, time I, I landed in Dubai, I, I checked into the hotel, it was, it was the middle of the night, and I woke up. And there was a mist. And only the top of Burj Khalifa was visible. And that immediately brought me to that verse. You don't think it's interesting. Eh? <laughs> I'm not going to say it next time. <laughs> Let us make a name for ourselves. Let, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. <laughs> They realize we are not like God. We may try to reach God, but we might fail. And the truth is, is that God sent his son to redeem the sinners. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a, 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 a scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then after Christ ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit descended to fill the redeemed. And for the first time in the history of mankind, the Holy Spirit is not coming upon a person and is able to leave the person. As it was in the case of the Old Testament saints. In, for the first time, the Holy Spirit had an indwelling in person. The Holy Spirit, we were sealed with it. And the Greek word is arabon, the Hebrew is eravon, which is down payment for our salvation. It has been determined. We are saved. This is the down payment. It's not the full payment yet because we're still stuck in this body. Look at yourself. <laughs> Put your picture from 20 years ago next to you. You're dying. And the Holy Spirit descended to fill the redeemed and to be, to be sealed. I mean, we are sealed with that Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in John 14, be, Jesus was praying, If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father. And we, He will give you another helper. Jesus is saying, I am not the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. This whole notion that oneness, that they're all one, is wrong scripturally. And he says, another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. There is no person on planet earth that is a non-believer in Jesus and yet is sealed with the Holy Spirit. So when people forward to me some sermons of some rabbis that have seen this or that have seen that, I immediately delete it. Because having the Holy Spirit in me, there is nothing I can learn from someone who does not have the Holy Spirit. And watch this, because it neither sees him, nor they, they cannot see him, they cannot know him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. God promised through his son to take the redeemed. For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had to you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered. Let's read that latter part together. Who delivers us from the wrath to come. God will send His Son and His redeemed back to earth. Which is the, I guess, disappointing part. <laughs> I mean, Jesus worked for 2,000 years on a mansion for me. And I only get to enjoy it for seven years. <laughs> then I have to come back with Him. It's not funny. I struggled with it for a long time. And I pleaded with the Lord, why do I need to come back? And he said, because you need to watch that for a th First of all, don't worry, he said. The thousand years millennium kingdom will pass very fast for you. Because for God, thousand years, like one day, one day, like thousand years. Time as concept will not be as a big thing for us. Okay? Plus, we will be with a new body. We can eat bolton all day long. We can share milk tart as much as we want. I guess there are some good parts to this. I'm just never. But God will send His Son and His redeemed back to earth. And the Bible says in Revelation 19, Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and we... And, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and, and makes war. Jesus will not come back to make peace. Oh, why are you saying that? Listen, let me tell you something. In his second coming to earth, you really do not want to see his face. You want to see his back. You want to ride behind him. Because when he comes to earth, he is coming to what? He will make war against all of his enemies. He will destroy them. He is not anymore that who turned the other cheek. That's it. The first coming is to save the world. The second coming is to judge. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Yes. Then the Bible said that God will judge the world. And that is the subject of our teaching this, e this afternoon. Judgment. And the fact that the world will be judged was known to people from the very beginning. When Hannah was praying in 1 Samuel 2 verse 6, she says, The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. In Hebrew chapter 9 it says, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be 
purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made, it, made with hands, which are copies of the truth, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enter the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, what? The judgment. God will make all things new at the very end. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. The state of the world will be so severe. The state of this planet as a result of the sinful nature of man from the time of the Garden of Eden, chapter 3, all the way even through the flood. The flood, just so you know, it was the first time rain ever came upon this planet. And by doing so, literally penetrated that canopy that was covering the earth and allowing the rivers under the ground to actually provide the water for the plants. And then planet earth was now open to so many bacteria and so many things that brought so many diseases and so much death to this world. And then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write for these words, are true and faithful. Make no mistake, the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, is estimated to have been written in the time of the patriarchs between 1900 and 1700 BC. Job in chapter 19 says the following thing, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. If you should say, how shall we persecute him? Since the root of the matter is found in me. Be afraid of the sword for yourselves. For wrath brings the punishment of the sword. That you may know there is a judgment. It's a concept everyone knew. And in chapter 34, he continues, says, For his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where this, the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. For he need not further consider a man that he should go before God in judgment. He breaks in pieces mighty men without inquiry. And sets others in their place. Therefore he knows their works. He cannot hide from God anything. Jesus confirmed by the way. That this life now is not the end. You see for the Sadducees in Jerusalem of 2000 years ago. They never thought there is any resurrection from the dead. That's why they were sad you see. <laughs> never mind. But. <laughs> This is the praetorial laughter. <laughs> Jesus confirmed. In Luke 20 he says, Then some of the Sadducees who deny that there is a resurrection came to him and asked him saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if man's brother dies, having a wife, and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took a wife and died without children. And the, this is how Jewish people always, always talk and argue about unnecessary stuff. The whole Mishnah and the Talmud is filled with rabbinical fables and rabbinical stuff like that. 
what if this and this and that and this? It's so simple. This is why, by the way, Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. These are the saints of the Old Testament. And apparently, we are going to see them again. There are two births for every person who is alive. One that he cannot control. And the other one that is upon his choice. Or at least his response. First birth from the water. You are born from your mother's womb, and you are born what? A sinner. Oh, but on my birth certificate, it says that I was born a Christian. <laughs> Then let me answer you. Your birth certificate is wrong. <laughs> Should I say it in African accent? Your birth certificate is wrong. <laughs> it should be said, born a sinner. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6 says. In Psalm 51, David admits, King David admits, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. No one is born Without sin. The Bible says in Romans 5. Just as through one man sin entered the world. And death through sin. And thus death spread to all men. Because all sin. Ephesians 2. And you he made alive. Who were what? Dead. In Trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among whom also, how many of us? We all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature... By nature, we were children of wrath, just as the others. This is why it's important that in John 3, when you quote, don't stop at, at verse 16 only. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But let's continue. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is what? Condemned already. Which means we were born condemned already. We lived our lives condemned already. And when we started to believe upon our faith in Christ, He plucked us out of the condemned already and put us in the not condemned. There is also a second birth. And that one is from the Spirit, when sin was forgiven. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said to Nicodemus, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. From death into life. Jesus said to that woman, Believe me. 
to the Samaritan woman, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. And then he said, you Samaritan worship that you do not know. We, the Jewish people, now we know what we worship for salvation is of the... Why do you think Satan hates the Jewish people so much? Because salvation, that's what Jesus said, by the way, not me. Salvation is of the Jews. It's a fact. Jesus was not a Christian. Oh. Are you willing to shoot me now? Jesus was not a Christian. He was born, what? A Jew. And he never converted. He is Christ. He is not a follower of Christ. We are Christians by ways that we are like him and we follow him. But he was born, if ever, a Jew. He says salvation is of the Jews. True. From the stem of Jesse, that branch came out. When the true, but the hour is coming, he said to her, and now is. Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman and he's telling her the most important thing ever. He said to her, right now, right now, as I speak to you, the rules are changing. No more need to go to Jerusalem to worship God or to go to Table Mountain to worship other gods. <laughs> to go to whatever. Because when the true worshipers will worship the Father, it's in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You can worship the God of Israel even from Pretoria. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we understand there is a need for a second birth. One must be born again. No one was ever born born again. You have to be born again to be born again, if you follow me. But then there's also first death, natural consequence of sin. <laughs> death spread, remember, because sin was there. That's it. And for the unbeliever, the first death is terrible, but there is something that even more terrible. And you'll see that in a second. He says, do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Where? Yes. Oh, don't use that word, please. I did not. It's in the Bible. Luke 16. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. See, up until Jesus resurrected from the dead, the only direction that could be pointed at when someone died was down. All people went down to Sheol. And in Sheol... There was two areas, Abraham's bosom for the righteous and the place of torments for the unrighteous. But it was all down there. This is why when, when King Saul came to talk to prophet Samuel in that science that they were holding, he actually came up from Sheol. Pretty angry, may I say. That means you can have feelings down there. John A, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, 
you will die in your sins. But what about the believer? Luke 23, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The one that was crucified next to him. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. It's very interesting because paradise is not necessarily heaven. In that context, it was a pardes. It was still the place of the righteous down there. Jesus is not yet resurrected. Remember, upon his resurrection, he took with him the souls of the righteous. And from now on, for the righteous, the direction is whoo, upwards. Ladies and gentlemen, so we're always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. The minute you die in this world, and it might happen to some of us. No, no, wait a minute. Don't be so afraid. The minute... When a believer dies, his body is here. We're burying him, remember. But his soul instantly goes up to be in the presence of Jesus. <laughs> For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's why Paul was so confident when he talked to the Philippians. He said, but if I live on the flesh, this will mean Fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be where? With Christ, which is far better. I'm not encouraging here, hey, go kill yourself. <laughs> Don't. You always need to choose life. But remember, the options for the believer are great. Either living here and having the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of Christ is it, or being at His presence. And every time we cry over someone that just died, because we miss Him, He does not miss us. <laughs> He's in the presence of Jesus. So death and Hades, we know death is disconnection from God. Let's move on. I want to move on to um, the um, part where we talk about the second death, which is important. I want you to know that there comes a day where every person that ever lived on planet earth will be resurrected. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 verse 6 the following thing. He says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. What does that mean? It means that there is not just first death that everyone might, I mean a lot of people might, I mean the only people that will not experience the first death are those who are raptured while they're still alive. The rest of them will, as the Bible says, go to sleep. The second death is what everyone should fear of. The second death is the complete, utter disconnection from the presence and the love of God forever and ever without any ability ever to be in His presence. That's the consequence of no repentance. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, Murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is what? The second death. Now may I add something, and probably you never thought about it, which makes me very proud. The second death is eternal life without the Lord, because they will be there forever and ever. The second death is after you resurrected and stood before God in that judgment. 
And if you were obviously, so you understand that when we are resurrected to stand before the Lord, the body that the non-believers will receive is a body that will be able to sustain everlasting presence in a burning lake. Right now, if I throw you to a burning lake, you'll die instantly. But they will be there forever and ever. They wish they could die. The second death is the longest life without life. You understand that? And then, of course, there are also two resurrections. John 5, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. There are many phases to that first resurrection that Christ was talking about. And why am I saying that? Because we just read from Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. For on him the second death has no power. Every believer until the moment that we enter into the millennial kingdom. Every believer will be resurrected with a different body, and it will be considered the first resurrection. Think about this. Jesus Christ is number one because he was the first fruits from among those who fell asleep. For I, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar, which is in this inscription, Paul said to the Athenians, the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, for nor he is worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things, and he has made from the blood from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also of his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and men's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of it to all by what? Raising him from the dead. And I read from Acts 17. The second group of people that will be resurrected in the first resurrection is the church age saints. Now we know that right after the resurrection of Jesus, those gra graves that were open in Jerusalem upon his crucifixion had saints already resurrecting. Remember the saints in Jerusalem? The Bible says many of the saints resurrected. But the, but the Bible talks about the fact that before the tribulation, any believer is of course considered a saint of the church age is considered the church is considered the bride of Christ let no one let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go Jesus said I go to prepare a place for you Jesus left earth went up to heaven to prepare in heaven a place for us. And then he said, I will come again and receive you to myself, so where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. 
Jesus said, first of all, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. I only go for constructions. <laughs> I'm going to prepare a place for you. And then I'm coming back to receive you. Who is changing address? We do. Not he is. He does. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Not all of us here in this room today are going to die. Now I can see some of us are like... I know I'm not going to die, but to, hmm, what about you? He says... He says, we shall not all sleep, which is the term for dying in Christ, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put immortality. So then when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And I just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 to 54. There's so much more. First Thessalonians, we read it today. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. If someone died here, don't be ignorant concerning him, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God, now listen to this, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You know what it means? When Jesus comes to the cloud to receive us, He's not coming alone. He's bringing the souls of all of us that died. Why? Because we're getting a new body. <laughs> Remember, the dead in Christ will ra be raised. Wait a minute, I don't understand. Okay, let me explain. When you die, your body stays here, your soul goes up. Jesus brings the soul for a new body to be raised so you can reunite with it. So you can reign with him in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Make sense now? Good. So he will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this is, we say to you by the word of the Lord, that he, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an arch... Which voice? Archangel. Not the voice of men. You can stand out and scream, Jesus, come! That's not what's going to happen. We need to eagerly wait for him, but not scream for him. He says, it's the voice of the archangel. And which trumpet is it? You can stand right outside with 15,000 shofars... And it's not going to help because it's the trumpet of God. This is why I'm telling Christians, don't wait for the feast of trumpets for the rapture. That's the second time you want to stone me right now. <laughs> it's not going to be by the trumpet of man. It's going to be by the trumpet of God. So we know that Jesus was resurrected first. The two witnesses will also be resurrected after they have been killed. Remember that? We see that in Revelation 11. Israel and the Old Testament saints, remember, the, the Old Testament saints will be resurrected also after the tribulation. Daniel 12 is talking about you go your way until the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. That's a promise that the angel is giving to Daniel. You're going to be resurrected too. You're dead shall live, Isaiah 26 says. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs. Then there is the tribulation martyrs. In the beginning of the millennial kingdom, they will all be resurrected. Those who died during the tribulation and are, because they put their faith in Christ, will also have that resurrection. So we all see that there are several parts but the second resurrection is for the non-believers. And it will happen at the end of the millennial kingdom. We know that from Revelation 20. So look at this chart. The chart. 
The first resurrection has five parts. The second has only one. And all of this is supported by scriptures. It's not my opinion. It's what the Bible says. The Bible tells us that there, is, there will come a time when every person shall stand before God to face final judgment. That's what Hebrews says. Hebrews 9.27. However, many people do not understand that instead of one final judgment, we read from scriptures that there are actually series of eight future judgments. And these are the judgments of God. Pay attention. First is the judgment seat of Christ. You have to understand we are all going to be taken. First is the judgment seat of Christ. We are all going to be taken and stand before the Lord. The judgment also called the judgment of the Bema is also is for the body of Christ only. For the church. For the bride. And we're not going to stand there waiting to see the verdict hell or heaven. We already made it to heaven. Unlike all the jokes that Peter stands in the gates and, 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 and is looking on the name list to see if you're... No, no, no. You won't even make it to heaven to find out if you're going to heaven. You will be in heaven. You understand? You, when we stand before Jesus, the judgment is not about punishment. It's about rewards. It's about awards. It's about pride. It's about... It's an amazing thing. The Bible says in Romans 14, But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it says. For we, in 2 Corinthians 5, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 2 Timothy, uh, 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 Paul says, to Timothy, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, not at the moment that Paul died, on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul is still waiting for all of us, so he can receive that crown. It's about receiving crowns, or maybe not receiving crowns. Depends what you did or what you didn't do. Depends on the intentions of your heart when you did what you did. And we know you're all going to be tested through fire. You might get there, but also maybe like a, something that is saved out of the fire. You don't want to stand there and see everybody getting their crowns and you smells like smoke. According to what the 24 elders did as they put their crowns at the feet of Jesus, maybe that's what we're going to do. And we want to put as many crowns as possible at his feet. Number two judgment is the judgment of the tribulation. The tribulation, known also as the great tribulation, the wrath of God, the hour of trial, Jacob's trouble. It depends which part you are emphasizing of the same seven years period. Take a look at this. It's known as... Great tribulation, wrath of God, hour of trial, and Jacob's trouble. Let's look at the list and see for ourselves. And see every one of those names is talking about a specific, a, a different thing. For example, can we put that slide and see for yourself? The great tribute. No, no, we move on. We move on. <clears throat> the great tribulation is talking about planet Earth. It's a tribulation that will befall the whole planet. The wrath of God will befall on the wicked. The hour of trial is the saints of that era. There is going to be a trial. And Jacob's trouble is when it comes to Israel. You understand that? These are all names of the same seven years. But every one of those four names refers to a different group of people that will go through that. And take a look at how the day of the Lord has three layers. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. There is the layer of God's dealing 
with Satan and his demons, the layer of God's dealing with the nations, and the layer of God's dealing with Israel. I'm not sure if you can see that. If not, we move on later. Don't worry. Jeremiah 30 says, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And the Bible says, but he shall be saved out of it. Matthew says, for then there will be great tribulation such as not been seen. Matthew 24, that from since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor even shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the sake of the elects, in order to keep a remnant from Israel, those days will be shortened. Why do you think that? Because Jesus will come back to earth only when Israel is ready. He is the one who said to Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The great tribulation has seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. And he talks about war and famine and death. In the first part, a quarter of the population of the earth is going to be killed. In the second part, in the trumpets, a third of the trees, the grass is destroyed. A third of sea life and ship destroyed. A third of fresh water is going to be poisoned. And in the first woe of demonic locust is going to hit the world. There will be fire and brimstone. A third of the people left are going to be killed. The two prophets preach and they do miracles. And the last seven, the seven bowls is boils and sea life, all sea life destroyed, all water poisoned, scourging sun, deep darkness, rebellious mankind, curses God, Euphrates River dry, the battle that you call Armageddon is happening, and worldwide earthquake, Babylon, mystery Babylon destroyed, huge hailstones that you really do not want to see. And then come the judgment of the tribulation believers. Not every judgment is necessarily a bad word, but it is an accountability. You stand before the Lord. And the Bible says that those who trust Christ during the tribulation period and are martyred, they will be raised and rewarded at the second coming of Christ. Some believers that the Old Testament saints and tribulation saints will be resurrected and rewarded together at the second coming of Christ or at the end of the seven year tribulation. Whether it's this or that, we know that it will be at the very end and not during the tribulation. That's Revelation 6 when he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar of the, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This is already describ describing what life will be on earth during the tribulation. Any person is subjected to death. Some will die, some not. We know, we know that not all will die. But take a look. They cry, those souls, because they don't have their body yet. They will only have resurrected body at the end of the tribulation. It's only their souls that is in heaven. Because to be absent from the body for the believer is to be present with the Lord. Remember, and their souls were out there and they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And and then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. Not yet, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. Revelation 13 speaks about that... Um, the Antichrist was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemes. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And then he opened his mouth, blasphemy against God, in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle. And guess who is blaspheming? Those who are where? Talk to me. Those who dwell in heaven. He knows. Some are already in heaven. And he's blaspheming them. He blasphemed everything that is good. Everything that is of God. 
any, everything that is of Christ. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. That can never happen to the church. That can only happen to the saints of the tribulation. If you want to be those that the gates of hell will not prevail against them, you need to believe now. Because if you don't believe now and you happen to find yourself in the tribulation, it was granted to the Antichrist to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose name have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the earth. And I saw thrones in Revelation 20, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast. He's speaking the specific group of believers who had not worshipped the beast. Those who lived through the tribulation. Those who witnessed the beast and yet did not worship him. I saw their souls. And they had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's why they have to resurrect and they have to get a, a, a glorified body in order to do that. And then comes the part that a lot of believers don't want to deal with. But it is going to happen because the Bible says so. At the end of the tribulation, there will be a remnant of Israel that will survive. The judgment of living Israel. And remember that. Unfortunately, if I take you right now to Tel Aviv. And I show the people of Tel Aviv the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist, the image of the Antichrist, the laws and rules of the Antichrist, two-thirds of Tel Aviv would follow him right now. Because they're already been conditioned by the mystery of lawlessness that is already at work. Make no mistake. The all Israel will be saved is reserved to those who did not worship the beast. And taken their, his mark on their hands or their forehead. Two thirds of Israel as Zechariah 13 says will perish. Ezekiel 20 says I will make you pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you. And those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell. But they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Daniel 12 says. Look Daniel received a revelation from the angel. About his people. And at that time Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen since there was a nation. There coming a point in the history of Israel in the future that will make the Holocaust pale. The Holocaust will be nothing compared to what the Antichrist will. And the Bible says such as never was ha has happened since there was a nation even to that time. Now if this is a future event, he's basically, basically saying... Anything that happened before that cannot be compared to what is going to happen to them. And then he says, and at that time your people shall be delivered. But then he says, who? Everyone who is found written in the book. And in heaven, there's two types of books. In heaven, when the judgment will happen, there's a stack of books. And there is one book. We'll talk about that shortly. Zechariah 13. Awake or sword against my shepherd. And he says, two thirds in it shall be cut off and die. But one third shall be left in it. And I will bring that one third through the fire. And will refine them as silver is refined. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Matthew 23. The one who killed the prophet and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to 
to you desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When Israel will acknowledge Jesus as Messiah, that's the Israel that will be saved. I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Zechariah 12, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look at me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. There has to be, you see the tribulation, as hard as it's going to be, is the only thing that will break the religious spirit of Israel. Is the only thing that will bring them to the point where the rabbis and their tradition is not going to save them. That's when, that's why the Bible says in Hosea chapter 5 verse 15, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense and through their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So Israel will be judged. Yes, and the ones that will not choose the mark of the beast and the ones that will eventually run away from him rather than worship him, those are going to be kept in the desert for 1260 days as Revelation chapter 12 says. And that, these are the ones that Jesus will bring back upon his second coming. And these are the ones that are going to receive him. And then all Israel indeed will be saved. Number five, the judgment of the living Gentiles. Now, I want to clarify some confusion. And I am apologizing in advance. Just as the Lord judges the Jews who survived the tribulation when he personally returns to earth, so he will also judge those Gentiles who remain. Not all Gentiles, not all believers will die in the tribulation. You understand that? Many will, but not all. Those who will survive the tribulation, who will still be alive, are going to be judged. They're going to be judged. And Joel chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 is saying the following thing. Behold in those days and in that time when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather what? All nations. Which is a, in other words to everyone who is not Israel who survived the tribulation. And they will come before me. This is, where, where is, go, is it going to be? In the valley of Jehoshaphat. Where is the valley of Jehoshaphat? It's the Kidron Valley. It's between Mount of Olives and Mount Moriah. And Jesus will be there. And what is the criteria by which he is going to judge them? I will bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will enter into judgment with them there on the account of my people, my heritage, Israel. Obviously, he's not talking to Israel. He's talking to the Gentiles about Israel. And he's saying this. Every Gentile that survived the tribulation will have to stand and explain to me what he did to the Jews during the tribulation. Ooh. Yes. Matthew 25 is the New Testament parallel to Joel chapter 3 of the Old Testament. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then, say then. Then. then which is when? <laughs> I have created a monster. <laughs> which is when? At the end of the tribulation. Don't tell me then. I heard that first then. When the Son of Man will come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another. Not separate a full nation, separate people who belong to the different nations. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his what? Sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those who are on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. 
inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Obviously, it requires for you to believe in Jesus to be able to inherit the kingdom and to enter into the millennial kingdom. You understand that? And because they were believers, they helped Israel. And that is why he made them sheep. He called them sheep. Because they didn't do all these things. Fed him when he was hungry and, and, and helped him. They did it to the least of his brethren. And because they did it to the least of his brethren, they are now considered sheep. Now make no mistake. They don't enter the millennial kingdom because they helped Israel. But because they were believers, they helped Israel. And that was important enough for God to count that as the main, main description of, of who they were in order to enter into the millennial kingdom. Then the righteous, and, 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 and let's move to the sixth one, the judgment of the Old Testament believers. We all know the resurrection and rewarding of Old Testament saints will take place after the seven years tribulation. Hebrews 11 says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Ladies and gentlemen, all the Old Testament saints wished they knew what we know and wished they were the bride. And I want you to know Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and the Israelites that believed in him and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jonathan and, and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophet and others. Therefore, these are the great cloud of witnesses. And so we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance and race and, and that race that is set before us. Genesis 15, Abraham, and he believed in the Lord and it, he accounted it to him for righteousness. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Metushelach. He liked the ch. Finally, someone says it right. <laughs> Americans, Methuselah. I'm telling you, the Dutch way, the Afrikaans way, Methuselah. <laughs> Say that. <laughs> See, I love the ch. <laughs> Look, a lot of people around the world, when they see that beautiful cheese, they call it Gouda. <laughs> but we know it's Gouda, don't we? <laughs> now watch this. And after he begot Metushelach, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. He walked with God. Even then, before Jesus was accepted as Lord and Savior. Then it happened in Elijah time as they continued on and talk that suddenly a chariot of fire. Elijah had to have something much more extravagant than Enoch. You know that. <laughs> we, we see the prophets. First Peter said, look at this. This is one of my favorite portions of the whole Bible. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. The salvation that we have, the prophets tried to figure out what is it. And they have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. You see how blessed we are? 
the Old Testament prophets were searching. Angels which they knew what we do. 2 Peter chapter 1. Knowing this first, no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of men. You don't go to school of prophets. Sorry. It never came by the will of men. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Old Testament incomplete work. Unlike the New Testament church that enjoys the complete work. Having the Holy Spirit versus the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament saints. We have the indwelling. They had the Spirit, but the Spirit could have left them. We know that. We are sealed with that Spirit. We have a complete work. Once and for all, the Bible says, Psalm 51, David says, Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Once and for all, Jesus was sacrificed and now he sat down at the right hand of the Father. No need like the high priest to come every time and sacrifice more. And then comes the final judgment of Satan and his demons. Christ will also judge Satan. The created spirit being who became the devil and his followers when he returns to earth. Revelation 20 chapter, chapter 20 verse 10. The devil who received them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You can remind it to him every day. We know your end, mister. Number eight, the great white throne judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. From those face, the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened. Ladies and gentlemen, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Which means not in the land's book of life. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. And then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Remember we talked about it. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What a tragedy. But think about it. God waited to the end of the millennial kingdom to do that judgment. Because what's going to happen in the end of the millennial kingdom? There will be a great rebellion once again. And Satan who was, was there for a thousand years in the bottomless pit will be released for a short time. And he will go out and deceive the nations. The Bible says. And I want to show you the timeline. More or less, so you can understand what we're looking into. Can we see that? If I, I hope it's there. I created a nice, beautiful. <laughs> timeline. Which you will see one day. Here it is. So you can see, once the rapture of the church take place. We are going to be having the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. And then comes the judgment of the tribulation. Then the judgment of the tribulation believers. And then the judgment of the living Israel. Then the judgment of the living Gentiles. 
and then the judgment of Old Testament believers. And only then we enter into the millennial kingdom. And at the very end, it's the final judgment of Satan and his demons and the great white throne judgment. And that is when all is done and God will make all things new, new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. And for the first time, Johannesburg and Pretoria, the people here will do this to the people of Durban and Cape Town. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because in the New Jerusalem, there is no sea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, while many Bible believers think that there will be only one future judgment day, where every person who has ever lived be judged, the scripture affirm that there are various judgments and it will happen in stages. This is the time for all of us to understand that we need to choose eternal life today. Your decision today will determine where you will be tomorrow. I always say to people, the future is giving us two parallel lines. The events of the world and our life and our choices. What we choose will determine where we will be during the events in the world. Either we are going to be on earth to experience the events or we will be in heaven to see the events. But our decision today will determine these things. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing. Appearing, it's in the sky. It's not returning on earth. Glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Choose eternal life today. And there are thousands, I don't know if you know that, but you are the minority of those that are watching this prophecy conference today. There are far more thousands of people watching it online right now. From many, many countries. And I, I want to tell them and you that if you're not ready today, tomorrow might be too late. Because there is nothing that must happen before the rapture. So as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed down right now, all of us, and all of you that are watching back home, as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed down, if there is anyone here this afternoon that want to acknowledge before God and even while he's here that he needs to be saved, that he's not even sure that he has eternal life, that if the rapture happened today, he doesn't even know if he's going to be part of it. If there is anyone, as all eyes are closed and heads bowed down, if it's you, please raise your hand. No one can see. Yes, I see your hand. I see your hands. I see your hands here. I see your hands in the back. I see your hands over here. I see her in the, in the upper gallery. I see her hands all around. Wow. Father, those people that courageously came before you today, understanding that as they are right now in their life, they acknowledge that they're not ready. The Bible tells us that these things you gave to us so we will know that we have eternal life. And Father, this afternoon, may it be a day of salvation to all the dozens of people that just lifted up their hands. Father, I pray.
that they will not go to bed tonight before having a personal, private encounter with you. On their knees, repenting of their sins first, acknowledging their need for a Savior, and then by faith, accepting Yeshua, the salvation, the promised, the one that through his death we can live, and the one that his resurrection gives us the power even to live for eternity. They will accept him as Lord and Savior today. Father, we thank you for the work of the Spirit now that draws people unto you. And we ask that today we will see dozens, if not hundreds, that are watching online returning to you or coming to you for the first time. There will be such a great rejoicing in heaven. And then, of course, from this point on, they will know that they have eternal life. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. And we ask all this in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, who is the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. We pray for the nation of Israel, for as many to open their eyes to understand who their Messiah is and to put their trust in him so they will escape that great tribulation. We thank you for South Africa. We thank you for this city. We thank you for this church. We thank you for every person who worked hard for this conference and for every attendee that is sitting here and is willing to receive your word. We bless you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.